The Pope arrives in Canada on a pilgrimage of penance. Will his apology for residential school abuse encompass the Roman Catholic Church itself? If he doesn't deliver that kind of an apology, I will consider the trip to have been a waste of time. Tonight, what some Indigenous people say they expect to hear, what some would say in return. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. I'll be with you throughout the Pope's visit to Alberta. I'm Neil Coxall in Toronto. Ian is away. We will also bring you what we've learned tonight about a Canadian who died while fighting Russian forces in Ukraine. We saw children uh, dying uh, on the TV and all these people on these civilians dying and he wanted to do something. And as California deals with wildfires across much of the U.S. tonight, the threat is high heat. Brutal. This is just too much. This is not my kind of weather. This is the National. And this is Edmonton. Right behind me there is Sacred Heart. That's known as the Church of the First Peoples. Pope Francis will be right here tomorrow afternoon. But what he does in the morning will be the most critical. On the grounds of what was Erminskin Residential School, one of the largest in Canada, in this province that at one point had more residential schools than any other. He will apologize after a long journey. The Alberta air was warm and welcoming for Pope Francis during his first moments on Canadian soil. The start of a six day visit he's calling a pilgrimage of penance. On the tarmac, he was greeted by Governor General Mary Simon and by George Arcan. Grand Chief of the Confederacy of Treaty 6 First Nations. And then by the Prime Minister. Inside the hangar, traditional singing opened a brief ceremony. A reception line of various Indigenous leaders and some residential school survivors ready to meet the Catholic leader in the hours before he makes history. I asked today the Pope to walk with us and create this new road that needs to be created. And it was a very uh, humbling experience to uh, talk to, to your holiness. Important to remember here is not everyone is convinced the Pope's words will bring significant change. He'll declare them on a First Nation south of Edmonton. Livia Stevanovic shows us what various people there are expecting, beginning with the chief who worked long and hard to make this moment happen. The arrival of Pope Francis closes a circle for Chief Willie Littlechild. And that's the, the, the moment that I invited him directly to come to Canada. Since 2008, the former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner made several personal appeals to the church for a residential school apology on Canadian soil, including one in the spring at the Vatican. I looked right at him, right in his eyes, and I said, survivors want to hear three words. I am sorry. And some people call it a jail if you come with me closer. Little child survived more than a decade at this former school. Now he will be the one to introduce Pope Francis at this first stop on his pilgrimage of penance. I was so thankful that he chose Muscochis because that's where I spent 11 years of my life and sometimes I couldn't go home. See, we got all the orange ones for every child matters. The Pope's imminent visit stirring up the past in this community. It's all coming back, it's all surfacing again. I left it alone all these years. I don't know how to prepare for it because of the fear, the um, you know, the emotion. The next generation is using an app to learn the language that was ripped away from their families. Because of residential school, that's why we don't really know our language. They say the legacy severed them from their culture. When the Pope comes, I want him to understand, so. I'm still angry, you know, all of the teachings that they imposed and forced on, on my mom. And it's because of her mom, Velma, 
that Carolyn Buffalo changed her mind about attending the papal visit. Hopefully, the apology will will um, give me some measure of closure, but I don't know. So, Olivia, firstly, thank you for, for all your work on this. And I, I'm curious what the range of expectations you heard from people there for Pope Francis tomorrow. Well, Adrian, we are expecting a significant statement from Pope Francis tomorrow, an official apology for residential schools on Canadian soil, and the words he chooses will be important. Many survivors are looking to the Pope to go further from what he said in Rome and apologize and acknowledge the church's role in running these institutions, not just the actions of some of its members. And of course, this papal visit is causing mixed emotions for many people. Many survivors won't accept whatever the Pope has to say, but for Chief Willie Littlechild, who is introducing the Pope on his territory tomorrow, he says that he expects this to be the pinnacle of his healing journey. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Olivia, thank you very much. Now, a lot of this is really hard to hear. It's really hard to confront. And so for anyone affected by residential schools and in need of support, there is a 24-hour line you can call. It's 1-866-925-4419. Our colleague Megan Williams reports for CBC News from Rome. You were on board the Pope's flight today. So, you know, Megan, this visit obviously critically important to Indigenous communities here, but it's also really important for the Pope. It is, and the fact that the Pope made this trip when he cancelled a couple of other very important trips to him this summer shows how important it is to him. He suffers from knee problems, sciatica, he has mobility issues, but he made this trip, and it was interesting, on the papal flight, he came back to speak to journalists, and he sort of stood there for a moment before he did the usual greeting up and down the aisle, uh, and he said, I think I can make it, and then he did. I mean, he's limping, but uh, but he's, you know, he, he's, he has to get around in a wheelchair. And uh, the other uh, remarkable thing about this trip is that is the focus. Uh, usually these papal trips are about evangelization, they're about supporting Catholic communities, getting the word out about the Catholic Church. This one, as the Pope himself has said, is a trip of penance, penance a pilgrimage of penance. And so if it's that important, it also means that there are big risks. There are big, big risks, and the, the biggest risk is what kind of apology the Pope will give. He gave a kind of half apology in the eyes of many people when, when the delegates came to Rome in, uh, in late March. Uh, he apologized for the conduct of some members of the Catholic Church. Indi indigenous people's communities are looking for a full apology, a more honest apology. So the risk for the Vatican is giving that, but without making it uh, seem that they were the, the, the only guilty actors. There was the government and other churches as well. All right, Megan, thank you very much. Thanks. Really good to see you. So tomorrow, CBC News will bring you history as it happens. I'll host a special on CBC News Network starting at 11 a.m. Eastern, working up to the Pope's expected apology. And on radio, Neil Coxall and Matt Galloway will host a special. That starts at noon Eastern on CBC Radio 1 and CBC Listen. So right here on The National, obviously, there's lots more coverage ahead of the Pope's visit. But for the moment, Neil is in Toronto to bring you the other news of the day. Hello, Neil. Hi, Adrian. Thanks so much for that. And one of those stories is Hockey Canada. Officials from the organization will be back in Ottawa this week. They are being questioned about an alleged sexual assault tied to one Canadian World Junior Hockey team as a second is now being investigated. As Talia Ricci explains, it is triggering calls for significant changes to the sport. While calls for accountability from Hockey Canada mount, many say the focus needs to be on changing hockey culture. You have to make sure you're teaching your players the right thing. And it starts when they're young. Just weeks after allegations of a gang sexual assault involving players in 2018, Halifax police are now investigating allegations involving the 2003 World Juniors, what Hockey Canada describes as an alleged group sexual assault. You should have taken it seriously in 2003. You should have taken seriously in the 90s, the 80s. These stories are not new. They're just being unearthed. At least five members of Canada's 2003 World Junior Team have come forward in support of the investigation, including Jordan Tutu, who denied any involvement or knowledge. Later this week, officials from Hockey Canada will be back before a House of Commons committee answering questions about their handling of alleged sexual assaults in 2018. The federal government has cut off the organization's funding. 
corporate sponsors have too. And they're going to have to work like any other organization in this situation to restore the trust of not only the, the public, but also of the government, which provides them with some of their funding, as, and, and very importantly with, with sponsors who are looking for concrete steps that are being taken to clean up the game. Some parents and members of the public say that needs to happen now. There has to be action behind zero tolerance and safe sport, because at the end of the day, safe sport doesn't just mean for the players. It means for anybody who's coming in contact with the sport. It kind of like takes away from like the sport. It's terrible that like it had to have been hidden for so long. And there's probably people who knew before and like didn't come out about it. And that's just like sad to know. Many now wonder just what it will take to put a stop to the sexual violence and change a culture that seems so deeply entrenched. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Police in Whistler, B.C. are investigating after a deadly shooting. RCMP confirmed to CBC News that two people are dead after the shooting. It happened at a hotel in Whistler Village. Two people are in custody. Police also say there's no ongoing risk to the public. The Integrated Homicide Investigation Team has now taken over the case. Global Affairs Canada has confirmed the death of a Canadian fighter in Ukraine as that country marks five months since the Russian invasion began. Emile Antoine Roissurois was fighting in Ukraine's east. As Valeria Cory Minocchio shows us, his reason for being there was no secret to his loved ones. Emile Antoine Roissirois' family is remembering him as sensitive, intelligent, and with strong convictions. We saw children uh, dying uh, on the TV and, and, and all these people, all these civilians dying, and he, he, he wanted to do something. But it was not the first time that he, he had the intention to, to join the army. Roissirois worked for a delivery company. He went to Ukraine with no formal military training. His sister Liliane and Aunt Martine say no one and nothing could have stopped him. She says we weren't going to be able to stop him because when he's committed to a cause, he has to see it through. Roissirois left Montreal at the end of March. He arrived in Poland first and transported medicine to Ukraine for 10 days. Then he joined the fighting. I would have created the dam. And That's the, where Roissirois uh, got the nickname the, the Beaver. Because you're the beaver? Because I'm the beaver. He spent three and a half months in the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine, which has seen heavy fighting. His family learned he died this past Monday from a friend and fellow volunteer fighter of Roissirois in the army. We all cried together for a long time, she says. Global Affairs Canada says it's aware of the death of a Canadian in Ukraine, but did not confirm Roissirois' identity. A spokesperson says officials are in contact with the family and are providing assistance, but isn't giving more information. She says she wants people to remember him for all his convictions and all he has given in his life. The family is now trying to repatriate Roissirois' body back to Quebec. Valeria Cory Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal. A boat has capsized off the coast of the Bahamas. Rescue workers managed to save 25 people, but at least 17 others have died. There was a tragedy at sea. The speedboat was reportedly carrying up to 60 people who may have been migrants from Haiti heading for Miami. Women make up the majority of the dead. Officials are still searching for the passengers who are missing. Members of a Manitoba First Nation who fled a dangerous wildfire say they're now dealing with health risks in the hotel rooms they've been moved to, riddled with mold, cockroaches, even used syringes. Peggy Lamb shows us what they're dealing with. We walked 10 hours and we're going to continue walking. Julian Dumas says she's walking to raise awareness about the disrespect she says her people have endured. Like there was no meal. And then when we go wait to switch, for them to switch us to another hotel, it took sometimes 12 hours, 12 and a half hours. She and five others are protesting the conditions some evacuees are living in while being helped by the Red Cross. Dumas says she knows the organization is doing its best, but she can't watch the children around her suffer. I seen with my eyes what's happening to them. I hear with my ears their cries. 
and with my heart, I feel their pain. Putting our family, children and families, our community members, into rundown hotels, and that, that's not acceptable in my part. 2,500 people from Matthias Colom Cree Nation have been displaced for 11 days, escaping a wildfire that's still deemed out of control. Some evacuees have reported unhygienic conditions in Winnipeg hotels, like cockroaches and mold. Others have been concerned with dangerous incidents happening outside. The Red Cross says there are no more hotel rooms available for evacuees. That's why they've set up this temporary shelter at the University of Winnipeg. Evacuee Mindy Bear says she's been lucky to stay at the same hotel since arriving in the city. She shares a room with her three grandchildren and says she's grateful for the Red Cross's help. But she says she understands how difficult it's been. Yesterday I was ready to spoil my like this. I was ready to scream. I was ready to pack up and go home. Mindy Bear says she was told she'd be able to go home in four days. And she says it can't come soon enough. Peggy Lam, CBC News, Winnipeg. On Prince Edward Island, cars have now been unloaded from a Northumberland Strait ferry two days after it caught fire with hundreds of people on board. Officials are now assessing the damage. Tugboat safely pulled the MV Holiday Island into its berth this morning. The ferry was just minutes away from docking on Friday when a fire in the engine room forced an evacuation. No one was seriously hurt. Northumberland Ferries says service between PEI and Nova Scotia will not resume on Monday and could be out for the rest of the summer. Environment Canada confirms a tornado did touch down in Quebec's Laurentians this weekend, tearing down trees, destroying homes and cutting off electricity. Hydro-Quebec estimates it will take two to three days to get the power restored. Well, the weather emergency across much of the United States is the heat. Sustained and dangerously high temperatures approaching 40 degrees. Tens of millions of people across that country are under warnings right now. Katie Simpson has the details. The Oak Fire has morphed central California into a hellscape. It scorched some 5,600 hectares of land since it started on Friday. Flames destroying nearly everything in their path, ravaging rural properties, devouring homes within minutes. More than 3,000 people are now under an evacuation order. It was scary when we left because we were getting ashes on us, but we, could, we had such a visual of this billowing that we, it just seemed like it was above our house and coming our way really quickly. The conditions are making it harder for first responders to gain the upper hand. Everything that's burning in the fire is extremely dry. We know that um, California has been dry the last few years and has gotten drier. California, like much of the U.S., is experiencing a spell of intense weather. More than 85 million Americans live in communities where there is an excessive heat warning or a heat advisory. It's so dangerous, Boston canceled its triathlon. Despite opening cooling centers, New York City reported a heat-related death and Philadelphia extended its heat health emergency. Brutal, this is just too much. I don't have a pool, so I just gotta go inside and get in the tub and put the ice cubes in the tub, but this is not my kind of weather. Americans are seeking relief wherever they can find it. It's particularly tough in the South where it stays hot even after the sun goes down. Don't underestimate, you know, the nighttime as well. It's, you know, it's well over 100 degrees on some of these nights, so be careful at night as well. 100 degrees Fahrenheit is roughly 38 degrees Celsius. The East Coast is expecting cooler temperatures this week. But dry, hot conditions are still in the forecast for Central California, meaning it's likely only going to get harder to fight the Oak Fire. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Innovative thinking will be key if Canada hopes to reduce carbon emissions. It doesn't make sense that these vehicles uh, you know, would not be converted. Coming up a bit later for you, the students working on a green retrofit for gas-powered vehicles. And I'll be back from Edmonton with more on the Pope's historic visit to Canada. What some would say to him if they have a chance. I would tell the Pope that thank you for coming, you know, because uh, we've been hurt. The urgent messages they hope he'll hear, plus the expectations of his apology. The Pope 
it ideally doesn't talk about individuals, he talks about the church. Is, is that a fundamental part of that apology? Up next, the word survivors hope to hear. Well, that was a moment for the history books earlier today in Edmonton. Canada's first Indigenous Governor General, Mary Simon, greeting Pope Francis on his mission of atonement, what he is calling his pilgrimage of penance. He is expected to apologize for the harms done in residential schools run by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, there are lots of thoughts swirling right now about that apology, about the weight of it, about the value of it. Many people are going to parse the Pope's words. Are they real enough? Are they robust enough? Are they the right words? Since all that matters are the views of those receiving this apology, we thought we'd have a conversation about expectations. And a warning, it's not an easy conversation. As a structure, the old Mohawk Institute residential school is imposing enough. It's worse when you look at a window, just one. Geronimo's window, there's where he cried for 11 years. This is Geronimo Henry, a Cayuga man from Six Nations of the Grand River, and this is his window. Starting as a six-year-old, and then every week for 11 years, he stood right here waiting for his mom to come get him. He wasn't the only one. Nobody's saying a word, but everybody's thinking, when's my mom coming up, or my dad, you know? I can't imagine little faces trying to look yeah. for their mom. Yeah, we did a lot of crying and screaming here, and. Uh, you know, swearing, His mom didn't come, swearing, and the abuse didn't go. That's where they cut out for the ropes to make the ring. There are notches still in the wood from where a supervisor at this Anglican-run school tied ropes, making a boxing ring. I know, well, I mean, you had to go against him. Against him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so imagine that, like a grown man, and then he's in the year like nine or ten because he's done something. And then there's the boiler room sometimes described by survivors as a predator's lair. I guess the whole point is it's extremely loud in here, so yeah. no one's gonna hear you yell. Yeah, a lot of screaming and stuff, and they don't hear nothing, you know. It's all still here, all yeah. evidence, and it's everywhere. He says he wants people to see it and feel it. The orange lines marking grids for ground-penetrating radar. Are there graves here too? There's work to come. Well, from the Anglican Church, an apology already happened in Canada earlier this year. Geronimo was there for it. This was an Anglican school. There was an apology from the Archbishop. Did it do anything for you? Yeah, not really. But it does help some people. It don't help me. All these apologies and I'm sorry stuff don't do nothing for the victims or the survivors. All it does is it makes the person that's saying I'm sorry, it vindicates them from any blame. It cannot be easy to be back here, but he says he does it often. It's part of his journey, each one so personal. To call water and wash clothes by hand and... Karen Shaboyer is Ojibwe from Rainy River First Nations, and she says she has a long way to go on her journey was sent to a Catholic residential school in Fort Francis, Ontario for nine years. On the top is my baby brother, Frank. Mm -hmm. It's time measured by the family taken from her. Huge losses and some poignant ones. An entire childhood without a toy or a birthday party. And your language? I mean, had you stayed at home, you would have been able to speak yeah. your language. Mm -hmm. You lost yeah. it? I never had it. My parents, they spoke uh, to each other, but they wouldn't to us, because they knew. They were. They also went to residential school. Mm -hmm. They knew what would happen to me. So they didn't. They didn't teach you your language as a way to protect you. As a, as a way to protect me, yeah. How How do you survive in that environment? I think I was numb, and I was just existing. Existing there, but even when you became a mom, I was just existing. I was just doing. What I, what's supposed to be done, mm -hmm. and I didn't know why. For my kids, I never, I never uh, babied them the way I do my grandchildren. That hurts. I guess that's the story of 
multi-generational trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And so for you to get to this point... Take a moment here and sit with that and ask, will the Pope's presence, words, and actions help? I don't even think the Pope should be here right now. I think all those graves should be dug up, every single one in Canada, before he comes here. He has to look at the damage that was done. He has no clue of how many little ones are still missing. And we don't either. So you, in your head, you can't even imagine that this has a good outcome, yeah. this visit. Mm -hmm. You can't even go there. No. They did horrible stuff. They did. They had no love whatsoever in their bodies. They taught about God, but they did not show it. Her faith in God remains, she says, but she really isn't sure she can even watch the apology. Everything about this moment is delicate, and all the words matter, many arguing they must go further than those the Pope offered this spring in Rome. Kenneth Young was there, a 10-year residential school survivor from a Pasquia Cree nation. What I sensed and what I saw in, in Rome from this uh, Holy Father was uh, that he was, he was committed. He knew that people had been damaged and that he needs to bring that here. He needs to bring that feeling. Working with the National Indian Residential School Circle of Survivors, he helped draft an apology some survivors would like to see, then shared it with the bishops. It's direct, including the Catholic Church accepts that its role in Canada's assimilation policy was wrong, and I apologize. The Pope ideally doesn't talk about individuals, he talks about the church. Is, is that a fundamental part of that apology? That's the most important expectation for me as a, as a survivor. If he doesn't uh, deliver that kind of an apology, I will consider the trip to have been a waste of time. If the Pope apologizes, it'll be good for everyone. It'll uh, begin the process of uh, reconciliation in a, in, in a, in a major way. The reconciliation work not yet done might just feel like hurt piled on hurt. So are those bricks on the old Mohawk residential school. Faded now, but here are the names of some of the kids who attended. Served time here, yeah. 11 years too many. Yeah. So there's different stuff there. You can tell this is old here because it's mm -hmm. turning black. 1950. But they could stand on this side here. His name is here too. The kids called him Fish back in the 50s. If we would have knew it was going to be such a famous thing, we would have had these things around there. For sure, and protecting maybe, it. Yeah, because but really, if the church isn't going to give back the records yeah. of who is here, you're yeah. left with the graffiti. Yeah. The Archbishop of Canterbury has now promised to release those school documents and has apologized, but survivors like Geronimo Henry are still doing the work, still collecting names, still searching for the dead, because here, sorry, is nowhere near enough. And Karen Shaboyer, who you just met, won't be here for this moment, but she told us she's really worried it's going to be tough for those who are aching to bear witness in person, that, that, that even with the government's announcement of $35 million to help survivors who want to be here, you know, the money came late. Uh, travel is now hard, so she's really worried some survivors may feel left out Again, so I will be back uh, with more a little later. You can probably hear the construction going on in the background. That is just to prepare for the Pope's visit right here tomorrow. But first, let's go back to Neil in Toronto. Thanks so much, Adrian. We'll see you in just a bit. Some students in Windsor, Ontario, are working on an innovative approach to reducing Canada's carbon emissions. We're trying to keep everything as driver-friendly as it was before. Coming up, their plan to convert this truck for a greener future. And a little later for you, getting from point A to point B with a piece of cycling history. 
And now the trophy presentation for Brooke Henderson here in Evian Le Bon. Canadian golfer Brooke Henderson celebrating, as you heard, a victory at the Evian Championship in France. She birdied the final hole to win by one stroke. It is Henderson's second career major win. She also won the 2016 Women's PGA Championship. Well, Canada is planning to ban the sale of gas-powered vehicles by 2035. But until then, many more will join the 30 million plus already on Canadian roads. Newly built electric vehicles are one option, but another could be converting combustion engines. Jason Vio speaks to a group of students and industry experts working on that. What's happening here is a test case planned and executed over two years. We're trying to keep everything as driver friendly as it was before. The goal is to see if gas powered vehicles can be converted efficiently into electric ones. A lot of these vehicles have a long lifetime and it's, it doesn't make sense that these vehicles uh, you know, would not be converted in order to still have the same or get the same benefits of an electrical system. The project is a joint venture between the company Canadian Automobility Enterprises, students at St. Clair College and the local utility company Enwin Utilities. It, it really is an investment. It's understanding, it's learning. The, the payback that we're going to get from the advanced view on what an electric vehicle uh, will do for us in a fleet perspective, what it's doing to help build knowledge within the college the next generation of engineers and, and fabricators. So in order to make this happen, they essentially had to pull the car apart. So they removed the connection points and then hoisted the Ford F-150 body off of the frame. And then you have the chassis exposed. They removed the 3.5 liter gas powered engine and other components and replaced it with eight massive batteries to run this vehicle and an electric engine. One obstacle to overcome, how to get the truck a charge if there's a lengthy power outage. We can't be on the side of the road with a, with a dead battery uh, while the community is looking to us to put the power in place. Up next is to get the truck back in one piece to test on the road. Ultimately, they hope this project leads to more commercial conversions, possibly in the farming or mining industries. Jason Vio, CBC News, Windsor, Ontario. Well, we have much more coming up for you tonight on our top story, the Pope's arrival in Canada. You don't fix that injustice. You don't just make that better. You don't say you're sorry enough times. Coming up, the messages many believe Pope Francis needs to hear. That's an honor drum song. It was part of the welcome for Pope Francis today here in Edmonton as the work of his visit this week gets underway. The critical first leg so focused on that expected apology tomorrow at the site of a former residential school in front of those who lost so much. Francis will also hold a holy mass at the Commonwealth Stadium and he'll come right here to the Sacred Heart, the Church of the First Peoples. That's why you continue to hear all that construction sound getting ready. Everywhere he goes, lots of attention will be paid to what words he says. But some Indigenous people told Nick Purden when Nick was right here that they have messages to share with the Pope too about their stories and their pain. <laughs> This is so, so beautiful that the Pope is going to be coming. So we pray a special way for Pope Francis. Lord, hear our prayer. Morning Mass at the Sacred Heart of the First People's Church in downtown Edmonton. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our I've come here to this service. Because of all the congregations in the country, the Pope has decided to visit this one. I want to know what's at stake when he meets the people here. In which you have God, our Creator's gracious gift. Amidi Von Cardinal, she's an elder at the First People's Church. And she tells me there's something she needs to say to the Pope. I would tell the Pope that thank you for coming. 
you know, because uh, we've been hurt. And being hurt once, you don't forget that. My father suffered in residential school, my brothers, my sisters, so I've lost a lot. This church has always been a second home for Yvonne. But when she found out what happened to her family in residential school, that changed. Did you ever get mad at the church? I did at one point. I stayed away from church for quite some time. And then after I started having my children, I, you know, I, uh, my mother was the one that convinced me to go back because we need this. And that's when I started coming back. And ever since then, I haven't given up. But for me, I want After to talking with Yvonne, I understand the stakes. People here are deeply religious, deeply Catholic. But it was also the Catholic Church that hurt them and their families. The disciples were amazed, say. And so the hope is that the Pope's visit might help reconcile those two things. So do not judge yourself. How come I don't have faith? No, it's nurturing the faith. The faith grows and grows through our trials in our life. This church isn't the only place the Pope will visit in and around Edmonton. Thousands of people will pack Commonwealth Stadium for a mass. But he'll also take time to come to this lake, a sacred place for Indigenous people. Now you see this concrete pad? This is where the Pope will drive up on another one of his stops on his visit. This is the Catholic pilgrimage site at Lac St. Anne, just north of Edmonton. Now Catholics have been coming here for more than 130 years. Many believe that the water here has healing powers. And the person who has organized the Pope's entire trip is an indigenous man who's also a Catholic priest. And while he's honored to be the Pope's right-hand man for his Canadian visit. I was only 18 when I went to the seminary. Father Cristino Bouvet tells me there was a time when he was torn about becoming a priest at all because his grandmother was a residential school survivor. As I began to learn in seminary the history of the relationship between the residential school system and the Catholic Church in this country, it was me who started to have these second thoughts and wondering, is this somehow uh, an affront to my own grandmother? I felt I needed to ask her how she felt about that. And so that's why on an occasion that I was visiting her at the farm, we were peeling potatoes at the kitchen table. and. I just sort of threw it out there. I was really nervous. I didn't know what was going to happen. And I said, Kokum, does it upset you or worry you that your own grandson might become a Catholic priest after having gone through what you did in the residential school? And the look on her face was like I, I stabbed her because she had this painful look on her face. And so I was terrified at what was about to come, but she just put her potato peeler down and grabbed my hand and she said, oh, my boy. I've known many good nuns and priests, and I know you would be one of those. Tell me about the criticism that you get as an indigenous man who's also a Catholic priest. Well, people have said those exact things to me. What, that, that you're just uh, using your heritage to make the Catholic Church look better. And if I have been able to reconcile within myself those identities, and then I respectfully ask for you to just simply acknowledge that that's been possible for me. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for the reconciliation within myself that I have personally experienced. You're going to have the opportunity to talk with the Pope. What do you want him to understand about Indigenous people in Canada today? Well, you can imagine I've thought a lot about that. So. Right. If I would be able to convey to him the irony in my own life as I experience it, that this little Catholic priest from rural Alberta is speaking Italian to the Pope, but could not speak in his other grandmother's native language, whose homeland this has always been. To try and drive that point home, the loss of language or the suppression, the act of suppression of language, uh, I think is among the most detrimental consequences of the residential school legacy. You don't fix that injustice. You don't just make that better. You don't say you're sorry enough times for that to be okay. That is one that I, I really 
I can't let go of. I, I, I can't shake it out of me. To honor his grandmother, Father Cristino says he's committed to making reconciliation his life's work. Reconciliation matters deeply to Indra Kaplinskas, too. She'll be there when the Pope comes. She believes that for the Pope's visit to be successful, he has to reach not just indigenous people, but all Canadians. My hope would be that the Pope's coming will galvanize and engage people who have not been engaged in the process thus far. Uh, and I think that reconciliation is not just the work of the indigenous people, right? In fact, it's got to be the work of both indigenous and, and non-indigenous Canadians. Indra is Catholic, and she teaches history of religion at the University of Alberta. She says reconciliation is something the Catholics should already understand. So at the beginning of a Catholic worship service, you have a confession of sins, and then you ask for help to do better, right? So there's a moment of reconciliation right at the beginning. And so I'm, you know, I'm hoping that for Catholics who are participating in that Commonwealth Stadium Mass, that when they go through that ritual, suddenly it will look different to them because they're going to be in a context of reconciling with Indigenous peoples. And they'll think, oh yeah, reconciliation, oh right, I have to reconcile with Indigenous peoples and, 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 and sort out how I've contributed to, to structures that are, have caused injustice. In gratitude to God for the life God gave to him, we Those injustices stretch back a long way. And so it's not realistic that one visit by the Pope will solve them. Still, wherever he goes, expectations are high. Do this in memory of me. Yvonne has struggled with being a Catholic and a survivor of residential school. She hopes the Pope's visit might allow her to fully reconcile with the church. Oh, I think it's time for me. I think it's time for me to forgive. This is what I'm working on. Sometimes you need to go on with your life. And if I don't forgive what had happened, you know, you live with that pain. Nick Purden, CBC News, Edmonton. It's really clear this papal visit is incredibly personal for so many people. And what will happen tomorrow could be powerful for them. A reminder, CBC News will be back with you for that. Special coverage begins on CBC Television and CBC News Network at 9 a.m. Mountain, 11 a.m. Eastern. But for tonight, Neil, I'll send it back to you in Toronto. Thanks so much, Adrian, to you and the entire team there. And we will take you to Montreal next, a change in tone, a very different story as we introduce you to a man who has a new old way of getting around his city. It's one of the best rides ever. It's my favorite ride. His ride makes our moment tonight. That is coming up. A lot of people have picked up new hobbies over the last couple of years, maybe sewing, baking, but Paul Gauthier picked up this antique bike on a whim with no idea how to ride it. Online tutorials helped him figure things out. Now he rides it every day. An antique with altitude, if you will, is tonight's moment. The thrill of trying to relive like what they used to live back then. I'm an old-fashioned bike rider, and this is my, uh, my steed. This thing completely disappeared, so I try to bring it back so people can rediscover it because it's really amazing. I started riding it in the city. At first, it was kind of uh, an experience. Uh, now it's like an addiction. This is a his history right now, rolling, you know, riding, and you can really feel all the bumps. So they called it the bone shaker. Also because the first time you ride it, you shake so much, it just shakes your bones. The speed, you can get good speed with this bike, maybe 20 clicks, and uh, a lot of attention. You're like really high on the seat, like a horse, kind of. And it gives you the feeling of kind of flying. Just mind that there's no brakes. No brakes, not a chance. It's hard enough to get on one of these chairs in the studio. Officially, though, it is called a penny farthing with names of coins representing the wheels. And Gautier says, he reminds us all that the first map of Montreal was for bicycles. 
Noted. That is The National for this July 24th. I'm Neil Kirksall. Good night.